All right, so welcome to our, uh, to our literary evening, uh, which is organized by uh, Book Breaks and um, organized by the Library Committee. I am your moderator today, Suvendrini Kakuchi, who happens to be the president of this club uh, for this year, for till, till June next year. Welcome very much, uh, everybody. Our guest today is um, Michael Hoffman, who is a famous columnist at the Japan Times. I read all his columns. I love them, in fact. And uh, the book, of course, is uh, Sipangu, Golden Sipangu, which is a collection of Michael's essays. And he tackles um, Japanese literature, history, um, and, of course, brings us back to the best centuries of Japan, the Heian period, and all that, so I'll, I'll leave that to him. Uh, Michael has come all the way from Hokkaido, Sapporo, or, uh, no, a suburb of Sapporo, close to Otaru. Seribako, which is a treasure box, right? Money box. Oh, money box. And uh, I don't know, we, we, we got derailed talking about how wonderful the place is where he lives, and how awful Tokyo is. <laughs> But I'm really glad you've come all the way, Michael. And um, Michael is from Canada, uh, but he's um, lived in Japan for more than half his life. And the book is self-published, which he, uh, which Michael says is a must for him, because he doesn't want editors going over his uh, writing and changing it. So um, that's also very interesting for us today. And I did. Because the name is so fascinating, I did do a quick Google search on Sipango, and I didn't realize Japan had so many different names. It had Wa, I think. Japan was called Wa, the Chinese Wa, and then it changed into a Japanese Wa, which means peace and harmony. And then Sipango was um, given by Marco Polo. So that's my little introduction, but uh, I'm very glad to see everyone here. The floor is over to Michael. Well, I haven't really gone into your lofty that, that's that's education background or anything, so <laughs> go ahead, but it's, it's my turn now. Yes. Okay. Somebody said I should open with a joke. I don't. I don't have a joke, but um, I have a tale to tell. I'm, go I'm going to tell you a story. May I? Like. Um, all the best stories begin, a lot of the best stories begin with once upon a time, and uh, mine does too. So once upon a time, there was a little boy who never knew his mother. Now how is it with such children? Is there a deep gnawing sadness within them, a longing they have no words to express, an emptiness in the soul that must be filled somehow if life is to get back on track? The child I'm speaking of grew up <clears throat> to be the eponymous hero, a very far from heroic. Hero heroes in our sense of the word in the time of which I speak would have been grossly out of place. Hounded out of existence if any had dared reared his head. Of a romantic tale written just about almost exactly a thousand years ago, not to keep you in suspense any longer, the tale of Genji. And this is a good time to be speaking of Genji and his time, known as the Heian period, because Heian Japan was everything, or seems that way, appearances are deceptive, of course, everything that our world is not, peaceful, tranquil, changeless, above all, beautiful. Beautiful, but sad. And Genji's sad beginning cast a shadow over his whole life. His father, the reigning emperor, loved a woman, a low-ranking court lady with a love that knew no bounds. Higher-ranked ladies, slighted in proportion as she was favored, were resentful. They unleashed on her their feminine slings and arrows. Today, we'd call it bullying. Times change and yet don't. 
They littered her corridor with filth. They turned away at her approach and would not speak to her. They made a great show of whispering about her behind her back as though she were not present, knowing perfectly well she was. The emperor, meanwhile, felt deeper and deeper in love. So far from basking in the royal favor, the lady sank into emotional and physical torpor, finally dying, wasting away. <clears throat> Not, however, before bearing the emperor a child, the shining Genji. The emperor's grief was as boundless as his love had been. He himself seemed in danger of wasting away. A female attendant, length, came to the rescue. She knew of a young girl named Fujitsubo, who was the very image of the dead lady. The emperor revived somewhat. Bring her, he said. He would treat her as a daughter. Yes, the resemblance was startling. There must be a bond from a former life, <clears throat> soon. Such is the way of this fleeting, dew-like world. The royal love was very much other than fatherly, a theme in the fullness of time to course through Genji's own rather complicated life. Genji at this point would have been 10, 11. Now, ladies in Heian, Japan, lived in deep concealment. They were all but invisible, enshrouded in darkness, enveloped in layer upon layer of clothing, hidden behind silk screens. When the author writes that such and such a lady was very beautiful, a frequently recurring phrase, she's not referring to a beautiful face or body, but to such things as the flow of hair as it cascades down to the floor, the modulation of her usually hushed voice as she intones a poem, the poem itself, the harmonious blending of the colors of her sleeves as they peep through the curtains, perhaps above all, her handwriting. Things in short that mean little to us, but everything to the people we are visiting. And so Genji, at the impressionable age of 10 or 11, saw nothing beyond an occasional glimpse of this new love of his father's, but he could not, the narrator tells us, remember his own mother, and it moved him deeply to learn from the, la from the lady who had first told the emperor of Fujitsubo that the resemblance was striking. He wanted to be near her always. On that slightly ominous note, I want for now to leave the subject of the relationship between Genji and Fujitsubo tangled and tragic relationship, and I suspect that those of you who don't know the story will have guessed where this is going, but maybe not how far it went. For now, I, I, I'd like to muse a bit on another aspect of Heian, which makes the time so strange to us. <clears throat> and how would we seem to them if they could see us? Well, that's another subject well worth musing on. And maybe we will, if time permits. I'm thinking of the assumption underlying every thought, action, feeling, every condition, in short, that, that mortal humans are subject to. The assumption, it's more than an assumption, it's certainty that life is not real. Life is a dream, or even, as at least one character puts it, a dream within a dream. Why should life seem that way? Say what you like about it, it's the most concrete thing we know or can know. We feel alive, we feel the earth beneath our feet. Why should the very things we touch, see, hear, smell, and otherwise sense most intimately be unreal? It's what Buddhism teaches, but the depths of Buddhist wisdom are accessible only to the deeply enlightened. And how many of us are that? Certainly not Genji himself, though a paragon of perfection in terms of his mastery of the arts, his world most valued. Poetry, music, painting, the social graces, his artistry, his high rank and political power, his rich and varied love life. None of this satisfies him. It's unreal. What he wants above all is to leave the world, become a monk, and devote himself to prayers. That's real, that's, that's real life. He knows it, 
all the characters know it. Maybe it's ultimately what sets the aristocrats apart. They know that life is a dream, whereas the brutish clods who make up the general population think the concrete is real. He knows it, but alas, this illusory, dreamlike, dew-like world of every day has its hold on us. A few manage to break it, Fujitsubo herself does, driven to despair by Genji's unwanted attentions. If life is a dream and this world an illusion, one does things and thinks thoughts and feels feelings that cannot but be puzzling to moderns like us, who, however we respond to life in this world, do for the most part take it to be real. Sometimes it seems all too real. Its reality seems almost to crush us. Sometimes it crushes us all together and we long to escape. Maybe our own time is a good example of that. Personally, I think it is. And I've been glad enough over the years to escape into the Genji. Maybe it's my way of leaving the world, or would be, if I could ever go far enough. What would going far enough mean? I sometimes picture this. Instead of reading the news daily, I would read Genji daily. <clears throat> All the time I now spend reading the news, seeing what's new, finding out what's happening, and why, and how, and what it means, and who it affects, and how, and how much it costs, and so on, I would instead spend reading Genji. No news, just Genji. No CNN or BBC. Murasaki Shikibu. Now we're talking about a novel which, in my edition, runs to 1,090 pages. How, how long would it take, cover to cover? Uh, you could do it faster, you could do it slow. Let's say a year. A whole year without news. Well, that would be leaving the world, indeed. Governments would fall and rise, bombs would go off, terrorists would crow victory, anti-terrorists vow revenge, viruses would mutate, the economy would sputter and revive, and I would know nothing of it immersing myself instead in what I think is the sharpest controversy to arise in the entire tale, the ancient debate over the relative merits of spring and autumn. Which season is the more beautiful, autumn with its leaves, spring with its flowers? Which season spawns the best poetry, inspires the loveliest music? No amount of debate seems to settle the question, though we are told the autumn side always has the larger number of adherents. If Heian were a democracy, autumn would rule. But, <coughs> like Genji, I stop short. I can't bring myself to do it. Why? To Genji, it was the flowers, the mists, the music, the poetry, the ladies, every one of whom he sighs, even the most ill-favored, has something to recommend her that made the world irresistible. To me, probably to most of us, it's news, information, the fear of being left behind. And just imagine, just imagine how far behind we would be left. Think of all the things that happened in just one of our years much, much more, surely, than happened in 400 years of Heian. Because nothing did happen in Heian. Almost nothing. People were born, grew up, lived, loved, suffered after their fashion, their highly poetic fashion, 31 syllables at a time, and died. The seasons changed. This imperial reign gave way to that reign. This festival passed, the next festival loomed. There really is something a little bit unreal about this. Imagine a person born in 794, year one of Heian, dying 50 or 60 years later, if not 30 or 40, for life was precarious and often short, more often short than long. People really did fade away like the dew. It's not merely a poetic cliche. They faded away, they sickened and died, and there was only so much the priests and exorcists could do about it. Imagine this person coming back to life around 1150, towards the close of the era. 
Would the world be different? The environment incomprehensible? The manners bizarre? Not at all. Our time traveler would blink, shrug, and promptly resume the life he or she had left, forgetting within a day or so that it had been left. Now try, try to look 400 years into our future, to the year 2400. Well, even 10 years ahead makes us dizzy. Our descendants 400 years down the road will look back at us and see what? Would we even seem, would we seem as weird to them as Heian seems to us? Would they even recognize us as being of their species? It's really an astonishing thing, such a motionless, eventless world spawning such a novel as the tale of Genji, a vastly peopled, intricately plotted, vibrantly alive work of an art form that in the Western tradition depends on action, surprise, suspense, the intrusion of the unexpected, a sense that almost anything can happen. The Genji is a phenomenon sufficiently, insufficiently appreci appreciated outside of its home country. There's a lively and ongoing debate among scholars as to what was the world's first novel. The earliest candidate is an ancient Greek romance called Daphnis and Chloe, about which I know nothing other than that it was written by one Longus, I think his name was, circa 2nd century AD. Other than that, we hear about Don Quixote, Pamela, Tom Jones, Robinson Crusoe. The time span is early 17th century to mid 18th. And what of Genji? Is Genji not a novel? I don't know what quality it lacks that would disqualify it. It has real, living, psychologically rounded characters whose life whose lives unfolded in a coherent and richly depicted society. It's not, of course, European. It flies in the face of the assumption, unquestioned though questionable, that the novel is a European creation. It's not. It's a Japanese creation. Murasaki Shikibu had no predecessors, and for centuries and centuries, no successors either. She stands alone. For centuries and centuries, it was all but unknown outside of Japan. And then suddenly, it was a European bestseller. The year was 1926. A British scholar of Chinese and Japanese culture named Arthur Whaley published the first installment of his translation. It rang a bell, it struck a chord. No less a critic than Virginia Woolf was in raptures over it. While Europe was still stuck in the medieval dark ages, said Wolf, this court lady, Murasaki Shikibu, was writing, was sitting down in her silk dress and trousers with pictures before her and the sound of poetry in her ears with flowers in her garden and nightingales in the trees with all day to talk in and all nights to dance in. <laughs> was it really like that? I confess I haven't, I haven't read the Whaley translation, being a devoted fan of Edward Seiden stickers, but Virginia Woolf seems to me to be visualizing not so much Heian Japan as ancient Persia, be that as it may. Imagine a world gutted and traumatized by the war to end all wars, World War I, invited to sojourn for a time with Genji and his friends. Another contemporary reviewer of Whaley wrote, it is a refreshment and a delight to be transported into an atmosphere and a society which reminds us of nothing we have ever known. So I myself found it when I first read the Genji 30 odd years ago. And so I find it to this day, which I guess is why I'm talking about it. Poetry in her ears, flowers in her garden, talk, dance. I wonder how deep Virginia Woolf had got into the tale when she wrote that. She might have added, a world of eternal childhood in which nobody grows up because there's no need to grow up. The world poses so few challenges to the unquestioned conceptions, beliefs, and practices that, adult, that adulthood is quite superfluous. 
She might have added, but didn't so far as I know. A few other things as well. One in particular has struck other Western critics. I refer to a certain moral ugliness, if we want to call it that, beneath the lovely, placid, childlike surface. The quote of all quotes in this regard, and I, I've used it myself more than once, is from <clears throat> a Scottish historian named James Murdoch, who, writing in 1949, handed down this judgment, and I better have a glass of water before I recite it because it's very hard to say. He said, the Heian aristocracy is an ever pollulating brood of needy, greedy, frivolous dilettanti, as often as not foully licentious, utterly effeminate, incapable of any worthy achievement, but with all the polished exponents of high breeding and correct form. Take that, hey Anne. It sounds comically sniffy to us, the sexually liberated heirs of the so-called sexual revolution, I've had a chuckle or two myself over Professor Murdoch's squirming discomfort. But to give him his due, he had a point. In our own sad and slightly twisted times, we hear much about sexual crimes against children. Suffice it to say that when Genji was aroused, and he often was, a child's trusting innocence, inviolable, one might think, to all but the crudest of spirits, made no impression on him at all. The starkest example is his conquest of the child Murasaki, not to be confused with the author, which begins with what our society would call a kidnapping, climaxes with what to us sounds like rape, and proceeds to a denouement, which is interesting. She becomes the love of Genji's life, the faithfulest, most dutiful, most loving wife a man could want, loved and cherished in turn by the man whose deep feelings and exquisite sensitivity redeem and even justify every moral lapse. When he says, as he fairly seizes the child from her serving women over their protests that her father is coming for her, I really do believe that my feelings for her are stronger than his. He's taken at his word, and justly so. There's no question of the depths of his feelings, the women back off, awed and overcome. Who are they to stand in the way of such feelings as only a Genji can feel? Which brings us back to Fujitsubo, whose story we left dangling in midair. Fujitsubo and Murasaki are branches from the same family tree. It is Fujitsubo's resemblance to Genji's late mother that drew Genji's royal father to her and drew Genji himself so fatefully and fatally. He ended up fathering a son by her, supposed by all the world to be the emperor's son. In a word, he cuckolded at his own father. Worse still, he muddied the purity of the sacred imperial line. The son, in the fullness of time to inherit the throne, is not a royal offspring after all. Genji's crime, in short, is not only a crime against an individual or a crime against society, it's a crime against the gods, the emperor held to be one. Murasaki, being of the same family, resembles Fujitsubo and therefore Genji's mother, the source of the longing in him that impelled him to spirit the child away. He sees his mother in her, she sees him as a substitute father. The stage is set for chaos, which duly sets in. Her serving women are aghast. They protest. Please, sir, you forget yourself. He replies, I must again ask you to be witness to the depths and purity of my feelings. Depth, yes. Purity? Maybe not. Be that as it may, they are such, his feelings, as to suggest the existence of a bond from another life, an unanswerable argument, accepted as such, and Genji has his way. Genji always has his way, except that he doesn't. It's not true. In fact, for, for so supposedly irresistible a lover, he's resisted rather often. The women who on the surface are the most gentle and pliant are the ones with the hidden strength to baffle even the likes of Genji. There's Tamakazura, for instance. 
And here too we see Genji violating, or trying to, a quasi-father-daughter relationship. Only quasi, mind you. Tamakazu is not Genji's daughter. She is the lost daughter of Genji's oldest and best friend called Tono Chujo. And here, permit me another digression, this time on names. For so, so nebulous a society as the world we're visiting, the characters hidden not only in clothing, hair, screens, and darkness, but also by the lack of anything we in our more solid age would call a name. A side sticker in his translation, I think, I think Whaley in his, gives each character one among the many changing sobriquets he or she bears as the tale unfolds. The name Genji itself merely signifies the non-royal status his mother's low rank condemned him to. Otherwise, all the names are references to poems composed by or about the character. Murasaki means lavender, Fujitsubo means wisteria tub, Tamakazura a string of jewels. Another of Genji's loves is called Oborozukio, the lady of the misty moon. His first wife, Aoi, heart vine. I'm not sure what heart vine is, but there is, there is uh, Svetsumuhana, the safflower lady, she of the red nose, the lady of the orange blossoms, and so on. The young man, who later in the tale cuckolds Genji very much as Genji cuckolded his father, is called Kashiwagi, oak tree. He's the son of Tono Chujo, just mentioned, whose name is a rank and maybe best, best translated captain. All names changing as rank or poetic inspiration decree or permit. A translation subsequent to Seidenstickers by Royal Tyler is faithful in this regard to the Japanese original. His naming corresponds to Murasaki, Murasaki Shikibu's. I haven't read it, but I've sampled it, and it's, it's pretty hard going. Very easy to get lost in who's who. Well, that's by the way. Where was I? Tono Chujo's lost daughter, Tamakazura, who ended up in, of all wild places, Kyushu, after her mother died. Well, that's too long a story to tell here, but one digression leads to another. And speaking of wild places, there was the tiny civilized little enclave of the capital, Heian Kyo, the city of peace and tranquility, today's Kyoto. Cultured life, which is to say life, began and ended here. And there was the rest of Japan, which was wild. I mentioned Oborozukio, the lady of the misty moon. This was the most uncautious dalliance, Den Genji's excuse being that she was young and frivolous, neither of which quality he ever really outgrew. Uncautious because in the undercurrent of political rivalry, always present, though the tale only hints of it, she was descended from the rival faction. She was an imperial concubine besides, the emperor at this point being Genji's elder brother. The affair came to light and Genji was exiled to Suma on the inland sea coast, less than 1,000 kilometers from the capital, and his numerous attendants busied themselves replicating the comforts and amenities of home, but it was not home. It was wild. The surf pounded, the speech of the rustic local fisher folks was un as incomprehensible as the chirping of birds, and Genji poured his despair into a poem. More remote, I fear, my place of exile than storied ones in lands beyond the sea. Tamakazura in the wilds of Kyushu. Numerous adventures and hardships bring her back to the capital at last, hardly countrified at all, strangely enough, possessing manners and graces worthy of her rank. A chance meeting at a temple with her old nurse, now in Genji's service, brings her into Genji's orbit. He knows she is his friend's lost daughter. Well, that will be his little secret for the time. He'll say nothing to his friend. He himself will be a father to her, but it's Murasaki all over again. He can't keep his hands off her, so beautiful is she. I can't imagine deeper feelings than my own, he says. 
the author's arch comment is, it all seemed rather beyond the call of paternal duty. Terrified and appalled, Tamakazura defends her innocence, Genji surrendering at last with the aristocratic grace one expects of such a man. Well, he thinks, I'll let my brother have her instead. That way, she'll at least be in the family within reach. His brother, Prince Hotaru, is an eager suitor. Not that he has seen her. It goes without saying he hasn't. Heian aristocrats glimpse one another occasionally, more often are invisible to one another. It's enough for Prince Hotaru to know her story, to have heard her whispered voice, to have been favoured with a non-committal poem or two in answer to his own passionate outpourings. Genji decides to help him. At a garden party, as music and sake flow, he releases a bag of fireflies, in the glow of which Hotaru does catch a glimpse, a dazzling glimpse of dazzling beauty, and his heart catches fire. Hotaru, incidentally, means firefly. Prince Firefly. Sad to say, it all comes to naught in the end. Tamakazura's fate lies elsewhere. Another story, unfortunately, too long to tell here. I'd love to tell it. Speaking of characters glimpsing one another, I haven't mentioned Genji's son, Yugiri, meaning evening mist. His mother is Genji's first wife, Aoi, Lady Hartvine. It was, an, it was <clears throat> an unhappy marriage arranged when Genji was 12 and she's 16. They never did take to each other, typically of marriages of political convenience. Anyway, she died giving birth to Yugiri, or in the grip of an evil spirit, as Heian would have it, the spirit of one of Genji's cast-off loves, wandering abroad and wreaking vengeful havoc without the woman herself knowing. In any case, Genji, now a widower, is free to focus his love on Murasaki, of whom Yugiri, growing up, had of course heard, but though she was in effect, his stepmother had never seen. Then as now, autumn was typhoon season, a particularly violent typhoon through Genji's sprawling mansion with its varied inhabitants and manifold gardens, gardens of spring, gardens of autumn, into utter disarray. Curtains were upset, concealment vanished, and in the confusion, Yugiri, who had seemed to be, seemed to be about 15 at this point, caps, catches a glimpse of the momentarily uncurtained, though of course very heavily clothed, Murasaki. Oh dear. Such beauty, the narrator tells us, was irresistible. It almost frightened you, Gary, to think why Genji had kept him at such a distance. Genji was with her. Smiling at Murasaki, Genji was so young and handsome that Yugiri found it hard to believe he was looking at his own father. Murasaki, too, was at her best. Nowhere could there be a nearer approach to perfection than the two of them, thought Yugiri, with a thrill of pleasure. Oh, we think we know where this is going, don't we? But Yugiri is a very different sort than his father. The matter pretty much ends here, and it is gratifying, or is it just a shade disappointing, to learn that he grows up into a staid and rather stuffy man. We like him, admire him, respect him. He's, of course, very handsome, as anyone in Heian who is anybody would have to be. But we would never dream of reading a 1,000-page romantic novel with him as the hero. I spoke earlier of escaping into Heian, and I would like, in the time remaining, to elaborate a bit on that. It's an escape from this time, place, and circumstances into almost their diametric opposites, from ugliness to beauty, frenetic change to virtual changelessness, noise to quiet, mass culture that excludes no one to aristocratic culture that excludes almost everyone. This is by no means to say that, that our time is all bad and theirs is all good. 
What I wonder would Genji and his friends think of us if they could spend a day among us? The first thought that occurs is, be our, ever, be our invitation ever so friendly, they wouldn't come. Why should they? They had no desire to escape their world. Quite the contrary, of other worlds, of lands beyond the seas, they knew nothing and cared less. China, of course, they knew through its poetry, and India, much more vaguely, through Buddhism, and that quite sufficed. They sought to know no more. How, we wonder, can a civilized people, so highly cultured, be so in incurious? Once upon a time, Japan and China had enjoyed a rich intercourse. China was Japan's teacher in the arts of civilization, and Japan a willing disciple. But China's politics grew unstable, and Japan, a century or so before Genji, stopped sending its priests, scholars, and merchants. It withdrew to assimilate its new learning, to Japanize it. That, in a phrase, is what Heian culture was, a Japanization of Chinese literature, philosophy, and government. Their lack of curiosity puzzles us, we who are so infinitely curious, forever asking who's doing what, how, why. If we hear of a thing, we crave to, un to grasp it, to see it, to, to understand it. What does it mean to, to understand something? Aristotle explained that very early in our civilization. It means to know the why of a thing. Now, this is as natural to us as breathing. We're forever asking why. It's a key difference between them and us. The question, har the question why hardly occurs to them. Why what? Why ask why flowers bloom when you're lost in admiration of them? Why does this man rise and that man fall, this enterprise succeed and that fail, this love blossom and that wither? We know the answer. Karma. This life explained by previous lives. We live those lives, but in this life have no access to them. That's a given, unquestioned and unquestionable. To ask why karma operates, what is the nature of human destiny, why the world is the way it is, what the gods have in mind in dealing with us as they do. All the various questions that have tormented Western civilization since its very birth left the Heian courtiers cold. So any hope that one or two or three of us landing among them from our baffling and bewildering world would stoke their curiosity is vain. <coughs> Come with us, we'd say. We'll take you back to the future, show you around. No, thank you, they'd say. We have no interest in cultivating anyone who wouldn't rather be here with us, we who have everything. That smugness rather repels us, not only in that it suggests a confining narrowness that would fairly choke us. Their environment may not be degraded as ours is and granted the loveliness of their flowers, gardens, and mountain mists. Still, isn't something missing in them? Much. On the other hand, there's this way of looking at it. Instead of questions, they had feelings. Instead of explanations, they cultivated emotional response to nature, to human relationships, which were themselves aspects of nature. They felt we question. Is questioning necessarily an advance over deep, cultivated feelings? Granted that we've gained something, we may also have lost something. Much, maybe. Genji's world was so very, very narrow, and ours so very, very vast. Too vast, maybe? As theirs was too narrow? Vastness isn't necessarily a virtue, and beyond a certain point it becomes, maybe, more than we can cope with. 
Might this be the source of the modern ugliness I spoke of earlier? Genji and his friends could close their eyes to ugliness. They could hide in beauty and pretend that that's all there is. It's a luxury denied us. Even apart from climate change and the very immediate and tangible threats it poses, when democracies fall, dictatorships rise and prosper, when people suffer, go hungry, lose their homeland and their homes, however far away, Myanmar and Afghanistan and Syria and Sudan and Ethiopia may be, to name just those just those unhappy places among many, many others. There's no such thing as distance anymore. No out there. It's all happening in here, in our own backyards. If not to us directly, it's what we see when we look out the window. Dictators rail against interference in internal affairs. There are no internal affairs. I don't escape into Heian because I think it's an ideal world, but because Genji's Heian Kyo was an internal affair, the rest of the world was an external affair, dismissible as such, dismissed as such, out of sight, out of mind. It is, as I suggested earlier, a rather childish attitude. Heian aristocrats could never be adults in the sense in which we are forced to be. Stunted growth? Yes, but granted growth is desirable. Are we so sure that our growth has been healthy? Maybe we could have grown another way, our civilization taken a different form. This is mere abstract musing, if you like, but one thing history teaches it is but there are so many possible human responses to the world, so many ways to be human. And the one prevailing now just about everywhere in the world, industrial technological capitalism, was merely one potential among many. Very good, certainly in its own way, but maybe not so good in others. The environmental crisis is just one evil consequence. Others include a loss of spiritual depth, the loss of beauty. Sometimes I amuse myself with speculations like, what would Genji think of the internet and social media? What would he think, what would he think of rock and roll? There's so much music in Genji's world. Everyone is a musician. Every gathering, a concert, an aristocratic Woodstock, there were flower children in the world long before the ones we knew. Well, let me close briefly by showing them to you. This, this is Seidensticker's rendition. It's from chapter seven, An Autumn Excursion, whose beginning will be our ending. The royal excursion to the Suzaku Palace took place towards the middle of the 10th month. The emperor's ladies lamented that they would not be present at what was certain to be a most memorable concert. Distressed especially at the thought that Fujitsubo should be deprived of the pleasure, the emperor ordered a full rehearsal at the main palace. Genji and Tono Chujo danced Waves of the Blue Ocean. Tono Chujo was a handsome youth who carried himself well, but beside Genji, he was like a nondescript mountain shrub beside a blossoming cherry. In the bright evening light, the music echoed yet more grandly through the palace, and the excitement grew. And though the dance was a familiar one, Genji scarcely seemed of this world. As he intoned the lyrics, his auditors could have believed they were listening to the Kalavinka bird of paradise. The emperor brushed aside tears of delight, and there were tears in the eyes of all the princes and high courtiers as well. As Genji rearranged his dress at the end of the song and the orchestra took up again, he seemed to shine with an ever brighter light. Don't you almost feel as if he were there? 
left Fujitsuvo, it was all like a dream. How she wished that those unspeakable occurrences had not taken place. Then she might be as happy as the others. Thank you. Thank you for coming and thank you for your attention. Um, thank you, Michael. Floor is open for questions. Yes, Steve. Hello, Michael. Yes, I've sir. read your columns for many years, and I really enjoy them, and uh, thank you for sharing your insights. So I really like your writing style. Thank you. Because you have a wonderfully discursive style, if I can call it that. I, I don't know quite how, but it's, you have a, a wonderful, unique style, and as a fellow writer, I, I'm deeply envious of you it does in that regard. Good to hear that. Thank you. Yeah, it's, no, seriously. Um, this summer, I was back in my hometown, of Vancouver and uh, with a friend of mine and we played the little uh, game which is like if you could be reborn in any one period or place in history where would you like to be reborn and we both said Heian hey era Japan as opposed to New Jersey in 1920 or whatever yes. not that there's anything wrong with that and and it has this wonderful you just elucidated it very well romantic appeal, if that's the way to describe it. But I want to play devil's advocate for a moment and pick up on a couple of points that you uh, mentioned in your talk. And that is, Mr. Genji, by our standards, is a pederast, right? Uh, he's a child abductor, and he's also a member of a tiny aristocratic class um, in a society where presumably 99% of the people lived in squalor, penury, uh, if not misery. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that. So, um, so I've heard. So I remember, I remember many things. Starting to read the Genji Monogatari in translation and thinking, this, this character is deeply unpleasant <laughs> um, uh, to me. Uh, I, I, I prefer the pillow book by, say, Shogunon, right? That's more sort of bitchy and, you know, gossipish, right? But Genji Monogatari left me cold. Now, my question is then, why should I go back to it and read it? Thank you. <laughs> Presumably I should. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Well, one of the things that has always utterly baffled me about Genji and baffles me to this day is that um, I, I think everyone here and everyone living in our time would agree with every word you say, and certainly I do, and yet people in his own time never condemned him as a pederast, as a child molester, as a... I mean, I mean cer certainly they didn't condemn their own society as um, exploiting 99% of the population who were desperately poor and living in squalor. They, the, the, the people living in squalor, the 99%, simply didn't exist. There's a, you mentioned the pillow book. Now, I remember in the pillow book, there is a passage about carpenters, a famous passage about carpenters who came to uh, do some repairs at the palace. And Sei Shonagon comments on their manners as they are eating their soup. And the, the carpenters are gulping and slurping their soup. And Sei Shonagon's comment is, you know, if this is the way of carpenters, I can't call it very charming. Uh, well, certainly it's not charming, but the, 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 point, the point is that these uh, ever needy, greedy, frivolous, dilettante, the, the, the ever pullulating, by the way, I, I don't know what the word pullulating means. Um, I came across this quote long ago, this is, a bit, this is another digression, I'm sorry, but uh, I came across that quote long ago and there was the word 
pullulating in it. I didn't know what it meant. I, I, mean, I can guess it means something lewd, but, uh, and I made up my mind not to look it up. I, I don't want to look it up. I, um, some things are better not to know. It just, just has such a nice sound, pullulating. Um, leave it at that. Anyway, that's, that, that's by the way. Um, no, I, I agree with you. Heian society is, is contemptible in many, many ways. And uh, would we want to live in it? Yeah, I would, like, I would like to live in it. As a member of that 1%, uh, I mean, I would like to be Genji. You wouldn't want to be the ten-year-old girl. I wouldn't want to. Well, well, but 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 Murasaki, Murasaki is a happy woman. Yeah, she's writing about this. Yeah. Right? No, 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 no. Murasaki Shikibu, the author, is not Murasaki, the character. I understand. Right? But no, no, she's not. But um, Murasaki, the woman. I mean, she. There's this this marvelous passage, this astonishing passage, where where Genji deflowers over the first time. She must have been about ten or eleven, and. Um, and, and Murasaki is uh, in tears and in terror, and and Genji is saying, uh, Genji says, well, you know, what, what's what, what's the matter with you? I, I was why are you so upset? I was hoping for a game of go. He says, I don't I don't remember the I don't remember the exact wording. I don't remember the exact context. It's not context, but it's something like that. It's the most grossly insensitive. I mean, this this from the man who was a paragon of sensitivity. Um, I mean, the most grossly insensitive um, response to her feelings. Um, and yet, she is a happy woman. She considers herself blessed among women because she is Genji's, Genji's love. And Genji does love her all his life. They're so I should read it? You should read it, yeah. Uh, I looked up Puyuli. Read, read it. I looked up Puyuli. Do you want to know what it means? I'm sorry. Oh, pullulating. You, you, uh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, I've, I've gone this far without knowing. Let me go a little farther. Um, I, I can guess pretty well. Uh, it means something lewd, right? right. Yeah. It's, it's not yeah. rude, but it's... No, lewd. But it's not lewd. It's not. Oh. It's, it's very biological, shall we say. Yeah, okay, well, same thing, right? <laughs> yeah, so you... Um, <laughs> Mm. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, uh, Michael, thank you very, very uh, interesting talk. It was very uh, enlightening and entertaining. entertaining. Well, you alluded to the fact that there is the, you prefer the side and the sticker translation. And you also alluded to the Whaley translation and to a later translation, I believe an Australian. Oh. Yeah, yeah, and I believe there's even a translation after that. I believe now there are at least four. Is that correct? Four translations in English. I, I, don't, I don't know anything beyond Tyler's, beyond Royal. I think th I think there's another one. Does anyone confirm that? I think there's one beyond Tyler's even. My point is, I haven't read the book yet. I've been meaning to. You, you haven't? I haven't read it. I confess, I haven't read it. I will hope to get to it. You, know, you, you astonish me. I why. Well, yeah. A shock, I'm shocking. I mean, <laughs> anyone else not read the book? Am I the only one that's, oh, I, two of us, the three of us, we, we form a club yeah, here. But, but we form a club, three, right? we form a club. I want to see you afterwards. We'll talk, okay? <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I've got, I made a friend out of this anyway, being <laughs> ignorant. But anyway, um, the point is, if I'm about to embark on this year long journey, what would you recommend? Which book should I read? Which translation? Side and sticker. Can I just ask you to identify? Um, my, myself? Yes. Okay. I, name and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I've known I know Michael over 20 years. I didn't. Yeah. yeah anyway, yeah, I forgot. Everybody else does not know yeah. me. I'm the person who's not read Genji. One of the three of us in the room. However, my name is Bert Saban. Bert Saban. Um, what do I do? <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> that, that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's, I, have, I have a lot of times I don't read Genji anyway. No, actually, I, I, I work at the U.S. Embassy. I work at the U.S. Embassy. <laughs> I'm okay. not in the cultural department, obviously, because I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm ignorant. I'm ignorant. Anyway, work at the U.S. Embassy, so I'm, I'm a poor representative of my country. Thank you. Many apologies. Anyway, so Michael, what would you, what should I do? I'm going to spend only, a year the only, on The this. only translation I really know is the side and stick one. I okay. love it. Right. His prose is, is so beautiful. Just so beautiful. I, I've, I've dipped into Whaley just a bit. And um, after side and sticker, it pales. I mean, it's 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 like it's like Tono Chujo beside 
Genji, you know, the, mm -hmm. the mountain shrub mm -hmm. beside the flowering cherry. Um, and uh, I, I have a copy of, Roy of, of, of Royal Tyler's because I, I, I reviewed it once and, I, uh, and I, got, I got into trouble because I reviewed it without actually having read it fully. <laughs> um, and and, right. and it, was, it was obvious. Mm -hmm. And Royal, Ty <laughs> Royal Tyler himself mm -hmm. wrote to the paper that I wrote this for, mm -hmm. uh, calling me an idiot. And, and he was quite right, actually, he had a point. Uh, but anyway, what I've read of Royal Tyler's, uh, it, it's, it's simply unreadable. <laughs> um, simply, to, to me, I mean, side and sticker. Okay. Is, uh, is, is, his prose is magnificent. Well, there are people who argue that Wales is the most poetic. So they do say that, right. they do say that. Yeah, it might, it might be true. I, I, I love Whaley's translation of No Plays, mm -hmm. which, which she did actually before Genji. Uh, but uh, his trans what I've read of his translation of Genji leaves me cold. Mm -hmm. For, for, for what little that's worth. I mean, very good. Then I'll begin by remedying my ignorance by reading the scientific translation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, yes, please. Yes, hello, my name is uh, James Cole. I'm actually a, a physicist. I, uh, <laughs> I'm a former professor and now a technology <laughs> consultant. Uh, I hope but, it's not uh, a question about physics. But uh, <laughs> my question to you, I, I'm also, as a sideline, I'm very interested in history. And one of the things I'm curious about, you mentioned that the Heian era was very unique, at least the upper class were not very curious about the outside world. But what about China? What about time? Thailand and Korea, these were also very closed worlds. And then I, I wonder too, you know, there's a big contrast with Europe. I mean, b way back I, lately I'm reading about Herodotus of ancient Greece about 480 BC. That's interesting, so and, am I. And uh, they, they, uh, who, who else is reading Herodotus? Someone is reading Herodotus. I am. Oh, you are, oh you're, you're reading Herodotus, very interesting. I, actually, I'm reading Thucydides, not Herodotus at the moment. Thucydides, but oh, 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 say, Thucydides say. came after Herodotus, yeah, right, more, right. a little bit more logical than than Herodotus. But anyway, uh, the point is that it, the, the contrast is. I mean, Greece was older than than Heian, I mean, when Thucydides and Herodotus were writing, this was about 484. 50 BC, BC, thereabouts, and Heian is a, about roughly a thousand years later. But but they were quite interested, at least these writers, mm -hmm. were, were quite interested in the outside world, right? I mean, they were very curious. And, and why was Greece different than, say, East Asia? I mean, what made Greece so different? What made, and I presume, East, by East Asia, I mean Thailand, these other areas, and I, I presume Heian was maybe similar. So, I mean, I have really two questions. Was Heian really different from the rest of East Asia? And then what made it different from, say, Greece at, at, at a thousand years earlier, as far as curiosity? Oh, that's a, that's a great yeah. question. If I, could, if I could answer that, I'd really be a sage, wouldn't I? Um, but... But you see, you say Asia. Uh, what, what about what about China? Tang China, Tang Tang era China, which is maybe two centuries before Genji. I mean, that, that was a very cosmopolitan culture. I mean, the whole world came together in in Tang China. Um, in, in Tang China, there were there were Muslims and Christians and Jews and uh, Zoroastrians and. So you're saying it was quite different. As far as I know, as far as I know, uh, and Japan itself was very, very open to to China at least, mm -hmm. and and to, and to whatever sure. came through China for for two hundred years before Genji. And um, what I'm, tr I'm trying to uh, trying to remember this now. Um, it was around a hundred years before Genji's time when uh, Tang collapsed and there was political turn I mean there, there are people here who know a lot more about China than I do um, Tang collapsed and 
there was political instability in China and Japan stopped sending its missions to China. This is about 100 years before Genji. And uh, there, there was a character, a character named uh, Sugawara no Michizane. That name ring a bell? Who lived about 100 years before Genji. And he was supposed to, he, he was a Sinologist, uh, a great Chinese poet and I was Japanese but wrote poetry in Chinese and he was supposed to lead uh, a mission to China this is, this is ninth century something and um, he, he backed out and one of the reasons he gave was politi political term one of the, another said to be that his Chinese was of course Japanese Chinese which uh, would have been utterly incomprehensible to Chinese Chinese. And uh, it would have been terribly embarrassing for, Chinese, for, for Japan's leading Japanese scholar to go to, Japan, to, to China and, and not be able to make himself understood. So he backed out. And that was the last, I mean, that, that mission never happened, never took place. And that was the last uh, chi uh, Japanese mission to China. And that's when Heian closed, as far as I know. I mean, this, this is what. Was it as closed as during the um, Tokugawa? It's interesting. It's the same sort of thing, isn't it? I mean, closed the closed country of the Tokugawa and the closed country of Heian. Yeah, I think it was. I think that's a good analogy. Um, did you ask about Greece, James, or were you? Mm? Greece, yeah. Yes. That's, um, it, it, it just seems to be a, a, a fundamental difference between the Eastern mind and the Western mind. The Western mind reaches out. The Japanese, the the West, the Eastern mind turns inward. I I, I don't pretend to understand <laughs> this. Can I, can I just give that, you know, I, it's a really interesting point you mentioned. I think there's, a, there's geography. For a start, Japan is much more isolated from the continent of Asia than, say, England or Greece is part of the continent of Europe. And also there's a political difference because, as you know, Greece, Greece was divided into a series of city-state polities. You had uh, a Steve, national state. Steve, you've got a mic there. I'm sorry. The, there's a geographical difference because Japan is isolated from the continent. Um, it's much more so than, say, England is from the mass uh, continental landmass of Europe, and certainly Greece is part of the continental landmass. And the political difference is that Greece was divided into a series of city-states in the period you're talking about, uh, individual polities, uh, whereas Japan had national unity. And uh, unlike Japan, uh, Greece had the uh, Persian Empire right on its doorstep, so it had to be interested in the outside world. Japan didn't have anything like that sort of external threat. So I think I disagree with Michael to some extent. The Eastern versus Western mind, I think that's a culturalist explanation. It goes some way to describing it, but there are basic geographical and political factors. It's very factors much cliche. That explain. I, 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 it is a bit of a cliche. Not that there's anything okay, wrong with that. Steve, okay, Steve, thanks. <laughs> are, have you lost interest? Hey, not at all. No, 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 no not at do. all. I just want to open the floor. Um, any more well, okay. questions? Uh, Mark, no? Okay. Anybody? Yes, yes, Shamas. A very simple question, but I want to ask you. <laughs> yeah. My name is Shashruti. Maybe that's difficult for you. But it is, yes. <laughs> okay. Could, could, could you say it again? Shashwati, I come from, you know, again, the East, so maybe we are a little bit naikoteki. So, uh, <laughs> it means eternal, actually, Shashwati. 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 Well, where, where, what's your nationality, if I may ask? India. Ah, India? One of the, yeah, right. So, uh, the thing that I was trying to ask you is, it looks like you read some translation of Genji, right? Yeah. So the point is, all this with all this translation, of course, someone is translating something from some other culture. So, I mean, is there any reason to believe that it is authentic? It is, I mean, the exact representation of what Murasaki Shikibu wrote. No. Mm. Okay. No. So then, then there is. In some fact, it, it, just just excuse me for one moment. Uh, there's every reason to doubt it, because each translation. It's so different from every other. 
right? Exactly. So the person who's right doing the translation also bringing in their own ideas, sure. right? So the thing is, I mean, your presentation definitely is very nice. Though I don't come from literature background or arts and humanities, it's not my uh, subject at all, so I don't understand. But still, it sounded pretty good. Now the question is, what were you trying to say? Uh, I mean, because I come from rational background, because I, you know, I'm, a uh, science I'm, I'm sorry, you background. come from a, a what background? Rational. rational. I mean, because I'm from science technology, so I have some yeah. rational thinking. So what I'm trying to understand is, so what are, were you trying to say that through Genji's eyes, can we uh, analyze the Heian period, which is about 400 years? <laughs> Oh, there's there's a lot more to Heian than Genji. If if I if I take your point correctly, uh, certainly there's a lot more to Heian than Genji. Uh, what what's my point? I, I was going to boil it down to a sentence or two. Uh, he, Heian is the the most. We were talking about this before the break, uh, before the talk. Um, it's the most different thing I know, the most different period and set of cultural attitudes I know to what's going on at present. And uh, at the risk of opening up a real can of worms here, uh, what's going on at present um, in many ways seems very repugnant to me. And uh, I long to escape into the most opposite thing I know, which happens to be Genji and Heian. Um, I've um, I, I've read, I think, most of what was written, w most of what survives from the Heian period. But Genji is the one that happened to make the most, the strongest impression. It's the one I keep going back to again and again whenever I feel like what I feel like these days that I just got to get away from this. And that's where I go. Have you ever read the Japanese, original Japanese? No, I, I'm, I'm not capable of it. <laughs> I, I, would, I would love to, I would very much like to. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, just not very long ago, I searched for, I searched uh, the net for uh, an edition of the original so, I mean, I wouldn't be able to read it without referring to the English, but at least with the English at my side, I can sort of get, get the flavor of it. But I, I couldn't find it. I, could, I couldn't find an edition. There, there are numerous modern Japanese translations of, uh, of Genji, but I'm not really interested in that. Mm. I would love to sample the original, the original. If, if, if it's at all possible. So what would be your guess, that this, tr this translation is more or less an authentic representation of this thing, a translation of? The only thing I, I, I can say for sure is that he, Seidensticker, claims it is. Mm. Uh, and uh, Seidensticker says that he, he loved the Whaley translation, but he feels it was not sufficiently authentic. Mm. He, he felt that Whaley embroidered too much. He left things out that he didn't uh, mm -hmm. didn't like so much. Yeah. Uh, he, um, he 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 converted too many of the terms into Victorian British, so that you, you almost think that you're uh, in early 20th century England mm. as opposed to Heian. And he 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 was moved to tr to to begin his translation. He said. Uh, as a corrective okay. to Whaley's too free translation. So he, he, he made a point of uh, being as literal as the English language would permit. Now, of course, the English language doesn't permit 100% literalness because English is so different from Japanese. We all know that. Um, I mean, English is different from modern Japanese, how much more so from Heian Japanese. There is another point because we were discussing about the Eastern thinking and Western thinking. So the translation is from the Western thinking, sure. someone with Western thinking. So just, I mean, this is just curiosity. As I said, I don't understand. Right. Thanks. No, that's an important point because coming from Asia, I know uh, that a lot of the 
the translation, the English translation, is what people know about Asian literature. I mean, most of them. Mm. And I think in Japan, I, I mean, the the uh, the Whaley and Side and Sticker is really what brought Japanese literature into the international world, right? Which is embraced by Japan. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Oh well, I'll get yes, Kurt. Please go ahead. No, James had a chance. Yeah. My name is Kurt Sieber, I'm an associate member. And um, why did I come here tonight? Uh, I have been reading over many, many years your articles or your col columns in the Japan Times. Thank uh, you. Yeah, I'm not finished yet. And, uh, Thank you. And uh, of course I had some kind of an imagination of what that person is. Uh, because it was very practical, very useful. Uh, it was uh, explaining us many things about Japan as it is now, what the real thing is doing, uh, rather than what uh, NHK is uh, telling us. Uh, and uh, now I have the feeling that they're totally, two, two totally different worlds in what we, what we saw tonight, or listened to tonight. And well, how do you connect these two different worlds? Well, uh, I, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm not clear on what two different worlds you're referring to. Could, could I ask you to take, take the mask off? For okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, well, well the, the, the uh, we are talking of a very uh, or you were talking tonight about the, 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 the history, uh, uh, lo long-term history of uh, Japan, and or a part of it at least. And uh, on the other on the other hand, in the uh, Japan Times, you were totally about today, and that's at least that's my feeling of reading of what. Uh, you have been writing, which was extremely useful in many uh -huh. ways to understand Japan as it is to as it is now, and uh, so uh, that's why I my mm. uh, my yeah. question comes. Well, uh, there is a difference be be between the one thousand years ago and uh, and and today. Thank you. Yes. Yep. Well, perhaps I, I, I should e explain that. Um, I, I write two two separate columns for the Japan Times. I, I I write one on history, and another column which is completely separate on what's going on today. Um, so how do you go between the two worlds? Oh, how do I go between the two worlds? Um, I, I I think I think I. I, th I think I'm, I'm there's this, this word, the, the word I'm thinking of is, is reactionary. It's a very good word. Um, and it, it's, it's not a very nice word. It doesn't have very nice associations. But uh, I, I think its literal meaning is um, uh, an instinctive uh, resistance to change. And uh, I, I think I'm a reactionary, mm. uh, not 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 a not not a uh, an intellectual reactionary, just an instinctive reactionary. That's the way uh, novelty strikes me. My first my first response to novelty is uh, stay away. You know, I don't like it. And uh, of course, this this time we're living in right now is is an age of onrushing novelty. And uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of um, defending myself against it, maybe by taking refuge in the past. Maybe that's I hadn't, hadn't really thought of it in quite those terms before, but maybe that maybe that explains it to some degree. Okay, right. So it's 8:30, and we have to stop. But thank you very much, coming all the way from Otaru. It was a pleasure. <laughs> it's a second time at the pre at uh, the FCCJ. Uh, th th thank you all for 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 coming.
And you've, and you, you, this is a token of our appreciation, a one-year honorary membership. And thank you everyone for uh, coming and joining us this evening.